Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show one of our favorite guests, Mr. Alastair McLeod. Alastair is a precious metals expert. He is the head of research at GoldMoney.com. Alastair has been a member of the London Gold Exchange for over four decades. His expertise covers the worldwide bond markets, corporate finance, investment strategies, and of course, precious metals. We are very fortunate to have him as a good friend to the show because we can call on his expertise to stay ahead of the game. And as we do so often, but right now, we are especially grateful to have him here to get his global perspective on a situation that has rocked the entire world. Alastair, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm very well, and thank you for asking me, Michelle. Yes, we are thrilled to have you here. It's always great to get your global perspective because, of course, you are coming to us from England, right? I am indeed. Where exactly are you? In the West Country, near a town called Exeter. Okay. All right. Now, the big economic picture from the other side of the world looks like it's much the same, Alastair, as we are seeing here in the United States. So we want to start off with the economy. Um, This is a fact that has been affecting everywhere. Europe, South America, Africa, London, all simultaneously in the very same economic situation from your vantage point. Where are we going in terms of money? Well, the first thing is that we are embarking on the second phase, if you like, of uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And what that means is that any thoughts of a V-shaped recovery uh, are banished because it's not going to be a V-shaped recovery. Um, The hope is that there will be a recovery, but at the moment that has been postponed. And what that is doing here, and I guess also in America, is that it means that the companies which thought that with a little bit of government help, uh, things would return to normal after the first wave and they could continue to trade, they're now beginning to think there is no end to this. We haven't got the resources to continue, even with government help. So we need to shut down our businesses. And there, is a, there are a lot of businessmen now in that position. So I think we're about to see a second wave of business closures. And therefore, the stimulus that is likely to come from government is going to be so much larger as a result, because it is dealing with not only this new problem, but the legacy of the first round of COVID-19, which They merely postponed in terms of unemployment and things like that by throwing money at the problem. So it's uh, it's now mounting up into something which is actually quite a bit more serious. And that's just COVID-19. We also must not forget that last September, and by last September, I mean September 2019, we had a liquidity crisis with uh, the repo market going mad in New York. And uh, we must also not forget that in 2018, there was a trade war between America and China, which continues. Uh, It's gone from the headlines, but it's continuing. And uh, we have at the same time that the end of the credit cycle, the cycle of bank credit expansion, so that the banks are now drawing in their horns. They don't want to extend their balance sheets anymore. They are overextended. So we have got a number of things coming together, which are immensely bearish. And that is now where we find ourselves. Alistair, let's touch on politics just for a moment. Um, Here in the United States, of course, our presidential election is just a few weeks away. From your perspective as an economic expert based in England, how much does our election affect the rest of the world and in what way? Well, it affects the rest of the world in the sense that it has a bearing on the value of the dollar and it has a bearing on the value of stock markets. Because if Wall Street uh, sneezes, we catch a cold. (laughs) 
as you might say. Um, but when it comes to the dollar, it is very important. So far, markets are not really, I think, looking at this presidential election in terms of how it might affect the dollar. Um, there is no doubt that uh, the Democrats uh, would be more expansionary in terms of um, uh, uh, money uh, than uh, the Republicans. Mind you, the Republicans are very expansionary as it is. So you could argue that uh, either outcome is a social socialization of money. But I think we must admit that uh, Joe Biden is likely to expand uh, the quantity of money or to encourage, if you like, the uh, uh, Fed to expand the quantity of money more rapidly uh, than Donald Trump. So I think a Biden win would be uh, very bad for the dollar. And I think it would also be bad for global inflation, monetary inflation, that is. Um, so we do. We are watching this with great interest, but so far it doesn't really seem to be at the forefront of news. The news is just being completely hogged by headlines on COVID-19 testing procedures and all the rest of it. So in a sense, we're sitting here, I think, with the mainstream media ignoring all the other very important things, including the presidential election that you're going through now. It's very interesting that so many uh, massive, impactful things are happening, including, you know, the printing of the money, the falling of the banks, the um, presidential election, um, we could go on, um, but they're all being, you know, dwarfed by this topic of this COVID-19. Um, Alistair, it's striking how just a few individual people on our planet can order the massive populations of every country to clearly destroy themselves. You know, the small businesses and the medium businesses and the economies, not to mention people's mental and emotional situations. I watched a video of a lady that had lost her husband and in the funeral home, her sons tried to sit next to her and the parlor director actually came up and physically pushed them away from her. Here she was grieving with their father and her husband right in front of the casket. And you just, people have lost all sense of emotional sensitivity along with common sense when it comes to money. And I want to ask you something. When the WHO, the World Health Organization, first came out and said everyone needs to lock down, it was massive news across the whole world, and the whole world did it. Now the WHO has come out and said the lockdowns need to lift and Alistair, the mainstream media, isn't saying a peep. It's on the internet, but you would think this would be explosive news that now everyone needs to come out of lockdown. They were very clear on this. It's destroying everything. Lockdowns need to stop. And yet we hear nothing. Isn't that extraordinary? Yes, it is. well, it is and it isn't. Um, I think the first thing that we must understand Stand is that governments do talk to each other on matters such as this, so that you will find there is, um, if, if you like, inv involving also uh, the World Health Organization, there are government agencies around the world talking to each other about how to deal with this problem. Very, very few governments are pursuing a different line from this common approach, as it were. So we started off, as you rightly said, with the World Health Organization advising lockdowns. We went into lockdowns, or most of us did. A few of us didn't. Um, the, in this country, certainly, and I don't know to what extent it is true in America, but I guess there's an element of it in America. In this country, the politicians were looking at an inadequate health service, not equipped to deal with a pandemic. And uh, therefore, what they wanted to do was to delay as much as possible the likely deaths from COVID-19 so that the health system could manage it. So 
we were not important in that sense. It was more important uh, that the health service survived. So you can see exactly where the conflict is in terms of interest between uh, what we think governments should be doing for us and what governments think they should be doing for themselves. So this is a very important point, and it brought it out quite clearly to me. Now, having said that, they're still all talking to each other. They're still all basically following the same uh, hymn sheet, if you like. Um, Donald Trump tends to not do that, or he appears not to do that. Uh, but the rest, of the, you know, the other countries are all basically following the same policies. So, um they have now agreed, I think, mutually that they have ruined their own economies. They cannot stand another round of economic ruination from a second lockdown. So they're having to come up with an alternative to the lockdowns. And that explains the policies that everyone is now pursuing. And again, it's common around the world what they're doing. They're, um, you know, sort of they're saying hygiene, distancing, no more than so many people together. Um, you're not allowed to visit someone's homes and then grading uh, areas in terms of um, how um, dangerous they might be in terms of infection so that you've got some areas where you've got very strict rules and you've got other areas where they're less strict and so on. So... But this is a, a, an approach I think virtually everyone is, is following, and it is the result of governments talking to each other and effectively agreeing, if you like, a world policy. It's just remarkable, again, that we are in a place where just a few individuals on a planet of a massive population can call the shots, you know. And then again, the who comes out and says, oh, you know, you need to lift these lockdowns. And you would think that would be massive headline news the same way the lockdowns were in the beginning, but it's like they continue. And, um, you know, it, it's just something to think about. Um, I want to turn back to precious metals because um, it's very interesting what the COMEX has done to itself, Alistair, <laughs> with all of its price manipulation and, of course, the printing of the money. Now everybody wants physical delivery. You know, we don't want you to keep it on paper. We actually want it in our hand. What is happening? Talk to us about behind the scenes at the COMEX. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I mean, if we go back to when... COMEX effectively got broken, which was back um, earlier this year. Um, at the beginning of the year, they were trying to reduce open interest on COMEX, which had soared to just under 800,000 contracts. They banged the price. I mean, you know, all the usual methods, spoofing, whatever, whatever. And uh, what happened was that, yes, they managed to get open interest reduced from uh, 799,000 down to around about 500,000. But the price stopped falling. And unfortunately for the bullion banks, what happened was that in March, uh, on March the 16th, the Fed reduced the Fed funds rate from 1% to zero. And the following uh, Monday, which was the 23rd, which incidentally was the day we all locked down, but coincidence, anyway, on the 23rd, now this is, this is governments talking to each other. On the 23rd, the Fed suddenly decided that they would have to make a statement about how they were going to handle this crisis. And remember that running into the 20th to the 23rd of March, the S&P had fallen by one third. Um, there was a rather nasty sort of deflationary crisis building, if you like, as far as the markets were concerned. And what happened was that the, uh, the Fed turned around and said, we will print however much it takes. And everything literally turned on that date it was either the Friday before or the Monday, the 23rd. Everything turned. Commodities went better. The only commodity that had a hiccup, of course, was oil, because you may remember there was the delivery problem because people uh, 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 were long, if you like, of um, very, very cheap contracts, and they were delivered and they had no way to put the oil. So it went negative, which was I ridiculous. remember that, right, right. Remember Nowhere that. to store it. Okay, okay. That was April. 
But apart from that, if you just sort of scrub through that, oil turned, copper turned, Dr. Copper, the important thing, and so on. And the other thing we discovered subsequently was that the Chinese decided um, at very senior levels that they were going to increase their sales of dollars and particularly U.S. treasuries with a view to buying commodities. Now, this is dumping money for real goods. This, if you like, is the way in which people believe, behave, and the, the wider public behave at the end of a hyperinflation. China was beginning to do it to the dollar. And we have already seen the Chinese yuan move from, uh, I think, it's sort of seven-ish, over seven, 7.3, and it's now currently 6.7. So you can see that in terms of the yuan, the dollar has gone down. The Chinese will probably continue to sell the dollar to stockpile commodities. Now, that also gives a problem to the Fed because so far, the Fed has been relying on foreigners hanging on to the dollars they get from the trade surplus and reinvesting it in US securities. But guess what? They're no longer doing that. They're turning sellers of US securities and therefore of dollars. And uh, I've seen lots of people um, believe that that is impossible. Foreigners will always need dollars. But the problem, Michelle, is that total securities held by foreigners in the United States are around about $20.5 trillion. And on top of that, they've got bank deposits, treasury bills, and commercial bills totaling a further $5.5 uh, trillion. So their total dollar holdings are around about $27 trillion. And that is about 1.3 times your GDP. Everybody's got dollars. They have got too much dollars for a world where uh, business is contracting, uh, trade is contracting. So we're going to see yet more and more sales of dollars, and that is going to undermine the dollar and make its purchasing power fall. It's a very, very important point. We are on the beginning of a rather uncomfortable journey for the reserve currency. So we're talking inflation. We're talking inflation and um, we're talking hyperinflation. Let, I want to redefine hyperinflation. People think in terms of prices. Inflation actually is not of prices. The effect of inflation is found in prices. What inflation is, is it is the expansion of the quantity of money in circulation. Now, I'm going to redefine hyperinflation and say that hyperinflation occurs when the rate of inflation, monetary inflation, is at an elevated level and the central bank is unable to rein it in and to stop inflating. When you get to that condition, you are getting into hyperinflation. Now, that is the situation in which every central bank around the world is beginning to find itself. This really means, I mean, just imagine, we have already had uh, an annualized 66% increase in US dollar M2 between the end of February and today. Now that's 66% annualized, that rate. And we are at the moment arguing, or you are arguing in your country about another stimulus package. Now, that stimulus package is, again, going to be rather large. And not only that, but um, I think it was in August or early September, there was a, an economist at the Fed uh, called, um, I think Kylie is his surname, uh, and he reckoned that the total stimulus just to stop uh, the V-shaped recovery becoming a U-shaped recovery is in the order of, of $6.5 trillion dollars. There's another three and a half trillion dollars to come. Now, this is hyperinflation. It is actually as simple as that. We are already there, yet so few people understand that that is the condition we now find ourselves in. Yeah, because no one sees the effect yet. No, that you're right. I mean, people wait for the effect, but by then, <laughs> you know, we've already seen you know, I mean, when, when the prices uh, start rising at um, ridiculous rates and you wonder why, you're probably sort of, you know, the average person is sort of thinking, well, prices are going up. I don't actually understand why. Um, everything seems to be getting more expensive. And then finally, they realize 
that actually what's happening is the purchasing power of the dollars, which they've paid their salaries in, they've paid their unemployment benefit in, they have their savings invested in, they have their pensions invested in, those, the, all, all those dollars are buying less and less and less. They're losing, it's the dollars losing purchasing power. Now, when people understand that, they start getting rid of dollars as quickly as they can, because they can see that if they delay in getting rid of their dollars, those dollars are going to buy less tomorrow. And that is no good as far as they're concerned. So they start dumping dollars. And when that happens, when the general public understand what is happening to the dollar, it is finished, completely finished. And it's not just the dollar. We've got exactly the same position in sterling here. They've got the same position in, in, in the Eurozone and the same position, uh, which may seem extraordinary to suggest, but in Japan, because sooner or later, the Japanese will wake up to the fact that, you know, this storing their dollars on their bank accounts, because all that happens is that when uh, the Japanese print more dollars, it just goes on deposit in the banks. That's why prices don't really move in, in, uh, in, in Japanese uh, yen terms because of the savings. It just goes straight into savings. That at some stage will finish. But I think the key to it is the world reserve currency, which is your dollar, is in such a mess that not only is that currency, fiat currency, uh, we can now see its final days rapidly approaching, but any other currency which is tied to it in terms of its reserves and in terms of exchange rates and so on and so forth is in exactly the same position. Wow. Before we go into precious metals um, and your price predictions, um, I'm curious to know if there is any fiat currency on the planet that has not done this to itself? Like, um, is there any suggestion to turn dollars into francs or dollars into whatnot? Or is every fiat currency in the same position? There is no fiat currency to escape to at the moment. It is possible that the Russians can stabilize their currency because they have deliberately reduced their um, holdings of, of, of dollars in return for gold. If they are prepared to back the ruble with gold, then that currency could be one which you could, you could buy, if you like, as an escape from uh, other fiat currencies. The Chinese are in a similar position, um, but we seem to be a long way from either the Russians or the Chinese actually using their gold to back their currencies. In other words, make their currencies exchangeable into gold. And when that happens, uh, if it happens, we could look at those currencies as being gold substitutes insofar as you could hold yuan, you could hold rubles, um, knowing that you could convert them into gold at, at, uh, at, at your option uh, when you would like to do so. But we are a long way from that. So the simple answer to your question is there is no other currency at the moment which escapes this fate of a complete collapse. I'll just, there's another aspect of this, uh, uh, Michelle, which is interesting. If we look at history, I think the closest parallel I see to what's going on today is uh, the John Law um, uh, experience, if you like, or experiment in France exactly 300 years ago. Just to remind, uh, remind you um, and your viewers, uh, John Law in 1718 approached the uh, French regent, um, who was the regent for the young Louis XV, and said, um, I have got a plan, I have got a scheme, I can... Um, uh, refinance the king's debts so that they are affordable and put the royal finances in order. And what he did was he set up a bank and the bank's notes were more accepted because of, it, because of various factors that he played on very, very cleverly, more accepted than even gold or silver, particularly the silver coins, because the silver coins were degraded and uh, uh, it was clear that they were going to be degraded again. So um, he set up uh, his own bank that was then turned into the Royal Bank, which was effectively the central bank, which could then print money. And he was appointed controller of the currency. 
So he got into that position. Meanwhile, he bought a series of interests abroad, which gave him a monopoly on all France's export markets, not just the Mississippi, which, you know, the French interests in, 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 in America, which was why it was called the Mississippi bubble, but it also included all the interests in India and China and so on, all the trade interests. Now, he needed to invest a lot of money in uh, building ships and uh, putting in the, the infrastructure for all that trade. Uh, and so what he did was he came up with a plan to merge his bank with his various uh, interests, the Mississippi venture, as they called it. And that was due to happen uh, in late February 1720. The currency started falter faltering. It started sort of losing purchasing power the previous November. Furthermore, what John Law was having to do was to print money to buy shares to keep the Mississippi share price high. Now, what is it, do you think, that the Fed is doing? It is printing shares to keep, sorry, it is printing dollars to keep um, uh, the US Treasury market uh, alive and at a very high value. It cannot afford to let that market slip. So it is doing exactly the same as John Law. Now, the outcome of John Law's exper uh, experiment was that um, by the following uh, autumn uh, or fall, if you like, uh, the Mississippi shares fell from a high of 1,200 livre, 12,000 livre to a level of around about 3,000 livre. But the livre itself fell from having an exchange rate in London and Amsterdam to having no exchange rate whatsoever by the following October, October 1720. In other words, the currency collapsed more than the shares. So we have a situation today where the dollar is being used, is being printed to support the market, to create a wealth effect, if you like, through the stock market as well. That will fail, and it'll fail because the banks are in trouble and also companies are in trouble and their current valuations are completely unjustified. So what we will see is the future of the dollar is completely tied with a into a collapsing market. And which will collapse more? Well, the John Law experiment tells us it's the currency that will go. So that is another way of looking at it. Oh, well, I feel better now. <laughs> 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 Let's go into silver and gold because um, everybody needs to understand where they should be putting their dollars to hold on to the value of what they can buy. So, um, Alistair, let's start off with your price predictions for silver and gold and your timeline. Right. Okay. Well, I don't make predictions um, as as such, but what? As I know, but I, I, <laughs> I still I, ask every time, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> right. What I can tell you is that it's it, it it's it doesn't make much sense to look at it in terms of you know what's the future price of gold and all the rest of it. The way to look at it is what's happening to the purchasing power of the dollar. The dollar is going down. So, in terms of gold and silver. That translates into a price which is infinite because it's not gold going up, it's not silver going up, it's the dollar going down. And if the dollar is completely valueless, has no value whatsoever, then you have got, an in, effect, in effect, an infinite price for sound money. So I would, what, I would, what I would do is I would suggest that any of your viewers look at physical gold and physical silver not as an investment, but as money. If you want to have a related investment, look at a mine, maybe look at an ETF, because those can be part of a portfolio. But when it comes to the physical metal, the physical metals are money, they are sound money. So look at it in terms of um, unsound dollars, unsound paper money, whatever it might be, and sound money. The other thing that happens, which is not captured in any sort of price relationship between, say, dollars and gold and so on and so forth, is that in a currency collapse, the experience is that the purchasing power of sound money, whether it's gold or silver, rises. 
And I'll give you an anecdote from uh, 1923 in Germany. As you know, that was the year when the paper mark finally collapsed. And it, uh, it went uh, as, I mean, looked at in terms of price, if you like, with sound money, uh, compared with the gold mark, it went to one and a half trillion paper marks. You know, wow, isn't that brilliant? I mean, but... Actually, what was happening was that it was the paper marks that were becoming valueless. That is the point I'm trying to make about money. But in, in Germany at that time, at the worst of it, you could buy a house in a fashionable part of Berlin, six bedrooms, nice big house and all the rest of it for a hundred dollars. Now, a dollar, a hundred dollars was the equivalent of four ounces of gold in rough terms, four, between four and five ounces of gold. You could buy a six bedroom house in a fashionable part of Berlin for as little as four or five ounces of gold. Now, what this tells us is that in the crisis, when money dies, when paper money dies, the value of uh, sound money increases I mean, just to incredible levels, absolutely incredible levels. And so your only salvation in a currency collapse is to have some sound money. The idea behind money, and I would say the difference between money and investment is an investment, you look to buy something in order to sell it at a profit. With money, you have money with a view to spending it. And that is probably how people with gold and silver in a monetary collapse will end up spending it. They will buy the things which are just so cheap in their terms that, you know, it's a, it's a life changer for them. And it's not going to take huge quantities of gold and silver for each person to actually have the benefit of that. As I, as I say, you know, I mean, you don't need to buy a six-bedroom house in a fashionable part of town for $100 worth of gold. <laughs> well, say for four or five ounces of gold, um, there are other things you could buy, something more modest. So I think even someone with relatively small savings, the value of the protection of having some sound money would be considerably more than they might think at the moment. That's a huge takeaway here for everyone, including myself, um, because mostly for myself, <laughs> <laughs> light bulb here, um, because when you have gold and silver and then your currency just gets debased, the value of everything, you know, it is, gets lost. exactly gets completely changed mm -hmm. and therefore with the little bit of physical metal you have, you turn into someone that can basically buy anything you want, whereas people without it, unfortunately, are not in that same position. Yeah. So and that, that brings me, uh, Michelle, that brings me to another point, and that is that uh, you wouldn't believe, governments don't seem to think so with COVID-19 locking us away, <laughs> but the fact is we are social animals. We will have friends. They may not possess any at all when the dollar collapses or our pounds collapse or the euros collapse or whatever it might be. We will have to look after them. Those of us who have the prescience to have a bit of sound money in reserve as an insurance policy, if you like, against this happening, uh, we'll also have to bear in mind that you will have relatives, dear ones, you will have friends and your local community. You will have, I think, some responsibility um, I think I would I I wouldn't call it a moral responsibility because I think that um, uh, uh, you know moral is a very questionable thing. But what I would say, from one's own personal interest, it is important to be able to offer some support to the community around you, your friends, your relatives, and close neighbours. So I think that anyone looking at this very seriously ought to also take that factor into account. Right. Right. And with the way, um, hopefully, the positive from the COVID-19, um, the takeaway is that we need each other. We and, do. Yes. Dead right. Yeah. Absolutely. We don't need government. We need each other. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Right. Right. Alistair, it is always amazing to have you on this show. Please nutshell for everyone what gold money is dot com is because I think right now it's very important for everyone to realize 
what you have available to them. And then please also mention how to follow your work. Yes, sure. Gold money basically stores gold and silver and platinum group metals on behalf of customers. Now, it's outside the banking system. This is crucial because the last thing you want to do is to have to fight a, the receiver of a bank to get your, your money back, prove that it's yours, not the banks, and so on and so forth. So it's outside the bank banking system, and I think that's desperately important. Um, the, you, you can also have a, a MasterCard, uh, which means that you, you can preload it. So um, and we run it in a number of currencies. I mean, dollars, sterling, euro, whatever. So um, you can access your gold and spend it as money, as it were. Personally, what I tend to do is I have the bulk of my gold and silver, which is not a huge amount, um, in gold money. And I have some coins, if you like, which I can then use, if you like, um, you know, if if I am right and everything uh, as far as paper currencies falls apart. So I would recommend people look at having a little bit of gold and silver, but not too much into hand because uh, then that becomes a huge security risk. You need to have it stored somewhere else in a vault, in a, an insured vault, perhaps in another country, so your government can't easily get to it. Um, you know, all these things you can consider. And that's basically what gold money does. And I write research for gold money, and I concentrate really on trying to get the message about sound money out. I mean, we're primarily uh, interested in sound money, and it just happens that sound money is gold and silver. So that is why we are interested in gold and silver. It's not the other way around. We're not trying to promote gold and silver as an investment. And I think that I must make that very, very clear. Absolutely. And how can everyone follow your written articles? Well, go to uh, goldmoney.com. And uh, at the top of the um, homepage, there's a menu, research. And under that, insights. Every Thursday, uh, Thursday afternoon, Eastern time, uh, I publish an article. Uh, and uh, the following day, on the Friday, I write a mar market report. Now, that's written in European uh, time zone. So, um, you know, things might have moved slightly <laughs> between me writing it and it being published. But I hope that your viewers will find both those useful to them. Yes, it's full of, of such amazing information every week. It's a great way to stay on top of what's happening around the world. Alistair, thank you so much for coming on the show today with your update. That's very much my pleasure, Michelle. Mr. Alistair McLeod, precious metals expert, economic commentator, head of research at goldmoney.com. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at Portfolio Wealth Global dot com.